Hello and welcome to our unit on immunology. Most of the information will come from the Tortura textbook on microbiology from chapters 16 and 17. Chapter 16 covers host defenses with respect to innate immunity. Innate immunity is a non-specific type of host defense where the body doesn't have to adapt or have any special education or training to do what it already is built to do. So this involves the first two lines of defense. The first line of defense and second line of defense will be compared to then a third line of defense, which will be covered in chapter 17. This is an overview of the various lines of defense within immunity. And it shows that innate immunity is comprised of both the first and second lines of defense and then the various components that belong in these lines of defense. And then when we move on to chapter 17, we can compare the adaptive immunity with um, all of the components within the third line of defense. For reference, let's go ahead and label the first and second lines of defense as nonspecific. And then the, the third line of defense, which is uh, various areas of adaptive immunity, are specific. This means that the body will have to have some sort of training or new experiences in order to adapt to a specific new event or pathogen in order to make antibodies and to uh, formulate a new defense in a specific sense. These are the various components that make up the first line of defense within the human body. And it starts with healthy, intact skin. Unbroken skin would be our primary barrier to the outside world getting in. And anywhere beyond where the skin is, like openings, natural orifices within the human body, there will be mucous membranes present. And as long as those are healthy, along with the skin, we have a good first barrier. Housed within our skin, we have sweat glands and sebaceous glands, and they're various secretions that help to keep bacteria out or to limit bacteria and their presence. The sweat glands, for instance, will secrete salt. So we know our sweat is salty, and that increase in salt significantly limits the types of bacteria that can be can survive on the skin. So generally we get salt tolerant organisms like Staphylococcus species that make up the large majority of normal flora on the skin. Also, the sebaceous glands secrete an oil. They are also known as oil glands and that oil is technically referred to as sebum. And oil's chemical nature is that it's made up of fatty acids. And so if you analyze the relative pH of oil as secretions from the sebaceous glands, we would see that the pH would tend to be slightly acidic from the fatty acids. And this lowers the pH, which also will limit the types of bacteria that can colonize and occupy the skin surface. Cilia is a component of the first line of defense that's found within the respiratory part of our airways. Uh, there is a place within our anatomy uh, that, with, that has cilia that's referred to as the mucociliatory escalator or mucociliary escalator and escalate escalate means to lift up or to keep the mucus from going downward into the lower respiratory tract so having healthy functioning cilia helps to sweep along the secretions from the mucous membranes 
and to keep fluid from building up in our lungs. Uh, urination and defecation are important on a daily regular basis in the fact that both of these processes will push out bacteria. We're constantly pushing out organisms that could be going into our urinary system or building up and so we we need to have enough hydration and moisture to, to flush these organisms out and to keep our body from allowing these organisms to stagnate and cause various problems like urinary tract infections. Defecation likewise is key in that feces that come out of the body are have been analyzed to be on average about 75% pure bacteria if you minus out the water weight. And with that in mind, every time we go to the bathroom and have a bowel movement, these bacteria are being pushed out so that we can clear not only the waste products, but also a lot of excess bacteria. And speaking of these bacteria, uh, normal flora occupy not only uh, small amounts in the urinary tract and then very large amounts, trillions, let's say, um, in the GI tract, but also on the skin. So the skin and mucous membranes can have many normal flora, and these are with us throughout our lives. And most of the time, they are thought of as healthy, beneficial bacteria. However, sometimes normal flora can be thrown out of balance, like when a person has an infection. The most common type of treatment for bacterial infection would be antibiotics. So we should keep in mind that antibiotic treatment not only may do the job of getting rid of a bacterial infection, but it could actually eliminate many normal flora and cause them to be out of balance. If too many normal flora are eliminated, it can open up the possibility for unwanted uh, foreign bacteria or other microorganisms to set up shop, to have less competition when compared to a healthy, uh, normally occupied first line of defense. And finally on this list, we have reflexes. Reflexes would be things like coughing. So if something gets in that's unwanted, we may try to cough that right out. And doctors now know that suppressing such reflexes can sometimes have detrimental effects. A good example would be when a person breaks a rib. So if an accident happens and someone falls on their side and they crack a rib or break a few ribs, one of the common treatments in the past was to tape up the side of the person to keep the ribs from moving and causing more pain. But if you use a lot of tape on that area of the body, it can actually suppress coughing. And then one of the complications of recovering from a severe accident where ribs are cracked and then the person is taped is that while laying in bed, they may develop pneumonia because the coughing mechanism is suppressed. Coughing is something that we want to be able to do with enough frequency to get rid of mucus that's excess that gets into the lower respiratory or to just start expelling out unwanted organisms that might be getting in there. Speaking of which, sneezing would be another very quick reflex that we can sometimes use to expel uh, a foreign object or uh, unwanted organism that can get into the body. Likewise, vomiting. Sometimes things we eat don't agree with us and it may not be just the food itself in terms of nutrients um, or an imbalance of nutrients, but Maybe there could be a pathogen or some source of food poisoning in there. And so a reflex would be for the body to reject that and either send it out through vomiting or perhaps even going the other direction. Sometimes diarrhea will result. And, um, and finally, another reflex is blinking. So there are many different reflexes. These are just the ones that come to mind as obvious mechanisms that can help to keep out would be foreign organisms or pathogens.
Here's a photograph taken with a light microscope from an anatomy class, and it shows the close-up anatomical structures of some healthy skin. And at the very top is a condensed layer of dead skin primarily that, uh, that makes up a good barrier. And there can be some openings where perhaps a hair follicle or a sweat gland or sebaceous gland can make its secretions through. The epidermis has a living part that grows more skin. And then below that, we have the dermis, which is a lower layer just located below the epidermis. And we can see the keratinized layer of the epidermis provides toughness and some waterproofing and just a general durability that allows for the first line of defense, the skin to be able to, to keep out most organisms. These are some close-up views of the ciliary escalator. Earlier, I referred to it as the mucociliatory escalator, or more simply, ciliary escalator. And here's a picture that has been computer enhanced in terms of its coloration. But nevertheless, these are real cells that include a section called goblet cells, which can contract and secrete mucus out into the surface onto the surface of the mucous membranes. And we can see the cilia, which are fine little structures that beat in unison to move along the mucus. And the mucus is there to trap uh, microorganisms or other foreign particles that then can be swept along and hopefully they will not gain the ability to, to bind to the mucous membranes themselves because they get trapped in the mucus. On the right here, we can see a drawing of the same structure, just so that you can see a little more easily what's going on here. Chemically, within the first line of defense, there are many components that we should keep track of. Lysozyme, for instance, has been mentioned in chapter four, earlier in this course, where we learned that this enzyme that the body makes can be found in the eyes and the oral cavity, then the tears and saliva, and they limit the types of gram positives that can exist as normal flora within the human body. There are some lysozyme resistant staph and strep that are able to exist as normal flora, but many would be pathogens that are gram positive will be destroyed by lysozyme's ability to digest peptidoglycan. Gram negatives are thought to be resistant to lysozyme because of the presence of their outer membrane. Within the skin, earlier it was mentioned that the pH can be low because of sebum or body oil, which has fatty acids. And we know that the stomach has a low pH, quite low because of hydrochloric acid. And the vaginal area also has a lower than neutral pH, primarily due to normal flora called lactobacillus acidophilus. Its name tells you about the pH that it fosters. Acidophilus. Okay, and sebum, which was mentioned here about the pH of the skin, influences the pH to go down because of fatty acids within the oil. And then meibomian glands are mentioned as specialized glands that are found in the upper and lower eyelids, and they are essentially sebum glands, sebaceous glands, that supply the eyes with sebum.
for having sebaceous glands located around the eyes on the eyelids is that when we blink and your eyes open and close, they seal shut. There's a slick of oil floating on top of the tears that are produced by the eyes. So you have the tears for moisture, but then this sebum helps to limit the types of bacteria as well as provide a way for the, eye, the eyelids to seal shut when they, when they close. Now it's time to examine the second line of defense. First, we have cellular immunity, and this includes various white blood cells, such as phagocytes. Phagocytes can ingest and digest various would-be pathogens. So we have neutrophils. Neutrophils are the primary um, phagocytes that are considered to be the first responders. They're sort of like the ambulances of the immune system showing up on the scene when an injury or some sort of invasion is beginning. And we say that they do the most cleaning up, uh, so to speak. The, they're the most phagocytic white blood cell. The eosinophils are also known to have some phagocytic activity. And then monocytes can be called up through a process of activation where when they receive certain chemical signals, they can transform into what are called macrophages. Macro meaning big and phage means to eat. And so these macrophages are termed to be either fixed when they're found in tissues or wandering when they're circulating in the blood. Phagocytosis is a complex multi-stage process that begins with recognition of something foreign, like a bacterium or a virus or something that could be a pathogen. And that recognition is sometimes triggered by what are called PAMPs. P-A-M-P. A PAMP is, a, is an acronym for pathogen associated molecular pattern. And these PAMPs may be present and recognized as foreign by binding sites that the phagocytes have called toll-like receptors. TLR binds to PAMP. So toll-like receptors are present on the surface of various phagocytes. And when this binding occurs, then this can facilitate endocytosis. Pseudopods are present as finger-like projections that can reach out and bind to microorganisms or facilitate the phagocytic event. And once that organism is brought in through phagocytosis, then the a vesicle or a membrane will form around the organism that's been taken in and this is referred to as a phagosome. The phagosome then will fuse to a lysosome, which is a place where digestive chemicals are present, that then when they fuse together, digestion can take place in what's called the phagolysosome. Various pathogens have found ways to defeat these processes. We've talked about organisms such as mycobacterium that have the waxy mycolic acid that resists digestion in the phagolysosome. And there are various organisms that can sometimes defeat this process. Um, the encapsulated bacillus anthracis would be another example because of the capsule. It actually resists the digestion by the phagolysosome. But if the phagolysosome is successful at digesting the organism, little bits and pieces of material will then be expelled as waste. And some of those 
bits and pieces will be pre uh, presented as antigens or foreign substances that can serve to educate and activate further immune cells, such as T cells, as we'll see later. Also within the second line of defense are natural killer cells, or NK cells. Natural killer cells comes from the realization that when they were first discovered, they seem to naturally have the ability to recognize foreign pathogens that are maybe something besides bacteria, like protozoans or fungi, or perhaps cancer or a viral infection. And so these natural killer cells, they recognize these foreign problems within the body and they will release granules. And within those granules are chemicals that uh, will basically serve to just try to destroy or bomb uh, and remove these unwanted uh, entities within the body. Also within the second line of defense, we have the inflammatory response. So beyond the cellular aspects of the second line of defense, there is inflammation, which is has four hallmark signs and symptoms. There, there's redness, which some medical textbooks will call rubor. And then you have pain, which can also be referred to as dolor. And then heat, which is sometimes referred to as calor. And finally, swelling, which can be referred to as tumor or tumor. And so these signs and symptoms make up the inflammatory response. And you might ask, well, why would the body want to experience redness, pain, heat, and swelling? But the effort is for the body to go through the healing state, the crisis, and then response and stages of healing. And so this happens first with these symptoms coming about by uh, vasodilation, where the blood vessels get larger and increase in size and that can deliver more defensive materials, followed by phagocytic migration, which is the defensive cells, which then will get to the site of infection or trauma, whatever the injurious event could be that can bring on inflammation. And when these phagocytes make their way out of the bloodstream and into the tissue, this is called diapedesis, followed eventually by repair. And let's take a closer look at that in the, at these events in the next slide. So in this slide, stage one, we can see some drawings, some close-up viewpoints of what could happen to bring about inflammation in the first place. So say someone's cut by a sharp object, like a knife, and then some of the bacteria will make their way from the skin surface. Even if it's just normal flora, there could be your own bacteria, but they get underneath the skin where they don't belong. And then all kinds of inflammatory chemicals are released. And this is part of our design naturally in our body. There are histamines, um, which bring about allergic reaction and inflammation, kinins, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, cytokines. We don't have to memorize all of these, but these are distressed chemicals that bring about inflammation and a pain response and pain itself as negative as it is is a sign from your body that this area needs to be babied it needs to be attended to either to be uh, left alone so that further damage does not occur and hopefully because of medical attention and sensibility we can clean this area out and help the body uh, the body's immunity so that it will fight against a possible infection. Now, part of the response here is for swelling to occur, and swelling will help to actually possibly close this area up so that that gap becomes smaller, and maybe that's a natural way of keeping more uh, contamination from getting in. But also swelling comes from the increased blood vessel diameter and 
when the blood vessels swell up, this will serve to deliver more antibodies and, and um, a high volume of phagocytes and also then the presence of uh, an activation of clot forming chemicals so that bleeding and loss of tissue fluid will stop over time. During the second stage, underneath this swelled up area, the swollen area is uh, an event where sometimes pus can form. And this is because white blood cells such as neutrophils, which are the first responders or followed then by macrophages as well, can build up as they exit the blood vessels. And this process is referred to as diapedesis. So diapedesis is, is where then this would deliver these white blood cells. And it can be noticed most easily by the formation of pus in an area that might be um, a place where you're fighting an infection in the body. If all goes well and the in potential infection or any infection is remedied over time, swelling will eventually uh, subside and the clot will start to be reabsorbed and the skin will eventually regenerate. And as long as the damage isn't too extensive, hopefully there wouldn't be a scar there. Other aspects within the second line of defense include the metabolic response of the host and other chemicals that have not been discussed so far. First, let's look at the metabolic response of the host. One of the initial signs or symptoms of infection can be fever. And fever is brought on by what are called circulating pyrogens. Pyro means fire and gen means to give birth to. So fever can be brought on. One pyrogen, for example, would be IL-1, interleukin-1. This is a type of cytokine. Cyto means cell, and kind means to, to move or change physically in response to a signal. So interleukin-1 is a particular pyrogen that brings on fever by interacting with the hypothalamus. And additionally, there is um, a type of response within the host called iron removal. So an aspect of our immunity is to keep iron closely bound and unavailable for bacteria to obtain this iron. Many types of pathogenic bacteria are have now been discovered to be dependent upon gaining some amount of iron. And so we can think of iron containing, iron binding chemicals that we have that are designed to not only serve their function like hemoglobin, for instance, found in our blood so that we can exchange blood gas from oxygen to carbon dioxide, but also to keep that iron sequestered away from bacteria. And there are some pathogens that can steal the hemoglobin, steal the iron from the hemoglobin in the red blood cells by lysing the red blood cells open. And the hemoglobin itself has a binding mechanism to keep the iron sequestered molecularly, but some very powerful chemicals referred to as siderophores are able to steal this away. So many pathogenic bacteria, disease causing bacteria, have been found by researchers who study these to produce something that steals the iron away from the host that they infect. And these specialized chemicals are called siderophores.
product secreted by the bacterium to obtain that iron that they need so that they can grow and multiply and um, in an effort to cause an infection. And another place where iron is bound by proteins in the human body includes lactoferrin. So hemoglobin is an iron containing chemical, but also lactoferrin has been discovered to be um, a protein that tightly binds iron, and it was first discovered in milk. We now know that lactoferrin is found in other places in the body with respect to cellular physiology and function, but milk was the first place where this was discovered. And we know that milk has more than one antibacterial property to it, including antibodies that are found in breast milk, but also there's lactoferrin. In the previous slide, chemicals were also mentioned as part of the second line of defense. And one specific chemical is interferon. Interferon is a product that's naturally produced by the body in response to a viral infection. So when a virus invades our cells, those cells can send out a signal like an SOS that can bind to nearby uninfected healthy cells that have interferon receptors. So various cell types within the human body have interferon receptors. And when interferon is received, the healthy cells can make what are called antiviral proteins or AVPs, which then will allow that those healthy cells that are uninfected to prepare to stop a virus from replicating or multiplying in future host cells. Interferon is also known to enhance the immune response overall. It gives various immune cells a boost in their activity. And because of that, interferon therapy has been developed for more than one type of treatment medically. Interferon has been used in the treatment of cancer as a form of chemotherapy. And also, we know that interferon not only boosts our body's immune system for fighting cancer, but it also can elevate immunity to fight off certain viral infections that respond to interferon treatment like hepatitis. So patients who have viral infections in their liver oftentimes may receive interferon therapy to reduce the severity of the infection and the overall outcome can be improved in hepatitis sufferers. Here's a picture taken from a different textbook, but I like it and I wanted to show how this depicts a sequence of events involving the production of interferon. So here we see a virus that comes along and if it successfully binds to and then invades into a host cell, it'll seek to replicate. But during this replication process, this the host cell may have a chance to sense and then respond to, um, to the viral infection by making interferon chemicals. And there's more than one type of interferon. Here it's labeling alpha and beta interferons. And these chemicals will then be secreted as protein products that can float through tissue fluids or through the blood and then bind to other host cells that have interferon receptors. And if a healthy cell is bound by interferon, then that may induce the production of the antiviral proteins. And these AVPs are what can stop future 
viral invasion and infection. And so this just is depicting how interferons can work as a model. Another major group of chemicals that are part of the second line of defense are complement system chemicals. And complement is comprised of more than 30 proteins that are found in the blood plasma and tissue fluids. And what these complement proteins do is they act in concert together to eliminate infectious microorganisms. And there are many functions that occur in response to complement proteins and their influence. They can dilate or arteries. Certain complement proteins will cause the, these types of blood vessels to increase in diameter. And other complement proteins can serve as what are called chemotactic agents. Chemo means chemical, and then tactic is referring to these chemicals ability to attract white blood cells. So white blood cells will move towards these complement proteins when they're bound to foreign objects or possible pathogens. And this brings about another aspect of um, complements action called opsonization. When complement system proteins bind to microorganisms, they coat the outside of the organism and then phagocytes can use the complement proteins as a way to bind and then pull in the organism and use the complement proteins like handles to pull in the organism that's bound by complement. And this is called opsonization. And finally, if some of the end stages of the complement systems uh, types of, of protein action occur, we can observe something called cytolysis. And cyto means cell and lysis means to break apart. And this occurs because of the formation of something called a membrane attack complex that forms, or MAC. When a membrane attack complex forms on a bacterial cell, it can act to punch a hole in the cell wall. And many membrane attack complexes can form um, on the surface of a bacterial cell and cause it then to lyse. This is a diagram outlining some of the various actions of complement described in the previous slide. On the upper left here, we can see opsonization visually where various complement proteins can bind to the outside of bacterial pathogens and then phagocytosis will be enhanced. These are the names of some of the complement proteins like C3, which can then be split and cleaved into C3A and C3B. And then there's a C5, which can be split. And then we see complement proteins like C6, 7, 8, and 9. And these are just some of the 30 complement proteins that I was mentioning. I'm not asking this class to memorize the various names of the complement proteins. That could be done in a later course. But the end result of many of these complement proteins acting in a cascade of events can culminate in the formation of the membrane attack complexes. So you can see these pore-like holes that are punched into the cell wall of, or the cell membrane, I should say, of the bacterial cell's surface. So you can see this picture here. This is an electron micrograph uh, taken with an electron microscope showing several membrane attack complexes that will then lead to the lysis of a bacterial cell. And lastly, we can see that the complement system facilitates part of the inflammatory process. And so there are many different functions that the complement system helps in terms of immunity and inflammation as well. Now we move on to chapter 17, which is about adaptive immunity, also known as specific components of our immune dis defense. A major aspect 
of the third line of defense is the concept of acquired immunity. And this means that the body has to acquire something new or build um, an adaptation over time, specifically to fight against a new pathogen or event. And there are two major arms within the third, li third line of defense. There's humoral immunity, which means antibody-based. And cell-mediated immunity, or CMI, which we'll define in the coming slides. Here we can take a look back at an earlier slide that reminds us of what's included in the first, second, and now third lines of defense. So the third line of defense includes antibody-based immunity, which can be referred to as humoral, as we'll see, and then the specialized lymphocytes like TNB cells. This diagram depicts the two arms within adaptive immunity. And on the left, we have B cells, which are named after the fact that they're born in the bone marrow. And deep within the bones where the marrow is present, there are stem cells. And these stem cells can give rise to many different types of immune cells. Another type of immune cell that also is born in the bone marrow are T cells. But T cells are named after the fact that they are found uh, in the thymus, which is a gland that's part of the lymph system. And this lymphoid organ then contains the T cells. And so T is in reference to thymus. And so B and T cells are primarily the white blood cells that bring about the functions uh, within adaptive immunity. Here are some of the main details found within humoral immunity. Humoral immunity is antibody-based immunity produced by B cells. B cells are a type of lymphocyte, and one of their major functions are to produce antibody defense proteins. And we know that B cells are named after the bone marrow where they're made from stem cells. And B cells will mature and migrate to various lymphoid organs, which are part of the lymph system. And this process involves something called clonal selection. Clonal selection is a process by which certain B cells will become activated when they come into contact with foreign molecules that activate the immune system. So antigens are foreign substances or molecules that will cause the immune system to react or respond. I'll write that down just as a reminder for everyone. An antigen is any substance or molecule that causes an immune response. And this is one of the mechanisms of how that immune response would occur, is that a B cell could bind using antibodies or receptors that are on the B cell surface where then the antigen could be bound. And once that happens, this will serve to activate a B cell, and that activated B cell can become either a plasma cell or what are called memory B cells. This diagram shows clonal selection as a process and some of the major events that occur after clonal selection. So at the beginning here, we have clonal selection where various B cells are made in the body at random. And these randomly produced B cells all have slightly different receptors, these Y-shaped 
antibody-based proteins that are present in the B cell population. And if we look closely, some of these B cell receptors could be shaped three-dimensionally at the ends of these little Y-shaped structures to be able to bind to an antigen. So the antigen, which is a foreign molecule, is represented by these little diamond-shaped molecules. And if one of those antigens happens to bind to a B cell that has the right shaped receptor or antibody, then this binding will cause an activation. And so when that B cell becomes activated, a second stage will result. And the second stage is clonal expansion. So the most valuable B cell, the one that was lucky enough to bind to one of those antigens, will be stimulated to grow and proliferate. So an army of B cells that will all be identical will result in an attack of the killer clones, so to speak. So that clonal expansion will result in a degree of specialization. And in this third stage, these specialized cells will result called plasma cells. Plasma cells are still a type of B cell, but they change in a way that they're, they increase their amount of endoplasmic reticulum. And specifically, it's rough ER because antibodies are blood defense proteins. And the endoplasmic reticulum that's rough has a lot of ribosomes that then will start to produce the same antibody over and over. And these antibodies will then spill out into the tissues and in the bloodstream, and they'll bind to and neutralize huge numbers of pathogens that are associated with that foreign molecule. And so the plasma cells are said to uh, aid in the secretion of antibodies. That's what they do. In addition to antibody production and secretion, B, a certain number of these activated B cells will go on to become not just plasma cells, but some will, be, will go on to become memory cells as well. And so memory B cells are not pictured here, but they are a part of our long-term immunity that results from the end of this process as well. The other major area of the third line of defense is cell-mediated immunity, or CMI. And this type of immunity is facilitated by T cells, which are a type of lymphocyte. B cells are lymphocytes, but then we have T cells. And they are housed in a lymphoid organ, the thymus, which is located as a glandular tissue that's in the upper chest in an area anatomically called the mediastinum. And so this gland surrounds the trachea and over time as a person ages, the thymus tends to shrink. And it's one reason why as T cell populations then decline that a, a person who's older will experience reduced immune function. So uh, when we talk about elderly people having less immunity or a weakened immunity, it's in big part due to this shrinkage of the thymus. And But otherwise, we think of the thymus as an area that houses these very important mature T cells. And what happens is, is these T cells differentiate, and this is in response to an education that occurs usually by the stimulation of some sort of foreign molecule or antigen. There are a variety of different T cells that can result from a cascade of events that begins with the helper T cell. So when we talk about cell mediated immunity, the helper T cell is the most valuable player. And what happens is, is this helper T cell oftentimes referred to as the commander of the immune system, will interact with the second line of defense. In this case, we see a macrophage, and this macrophage is acting as an antigen 
presenting cell, or APC. So the macrophage acts as a phagocyte, and it ingests a bacterium or whichever pathogen that it recognizes and will then eventually digest and destroy and it will take a, a bit or piece an antigen and put it onto its cell membrane surface and during this antigen presentation the helper T cell will come over and make a physical contact like a handshake or a docking mechanism will occur here and when that occurs the helper T cell will become activated to differentiate into various types of other cells, including cytotoxic T cells, which will be outlined in subsequent slides, and memory T cells for long-term immunity in fighting a, a given specific pathogen or associated antigens that go along with it. There are four major types of T cells that will be outlined in this lecture, beginning with cytotoxic T cells as a major type. They're called cytotoxic because they function to destroy cells by lysis. Another term for that is cytolytic. Cyto meaning cell, and then lytic is referring to breaking apart cells to destroy them. And most often cytotoxic T cells are deployed to destroy virally infected cells, as well as to fight cancer. And unfortunately, cytotoxic T cells can also participate in organ rejection. So in patients who have received an organ transplant, it's important that they receive immunosuppressive drugs that will suppress the ability of cytotoxic T cells to mount uh, what would normally be possibly a, a rejection response where they would attack a foreign organ from a donor. But in the case of transplanted cells, um, certain pharmaceuticals are used to suppress cytotoxic T cell response. Also, we have helper T cells. Helper T cells are central to all of the third line of defenses function, and they are one of the most valuable cell types then, um, as they're referred to as commanders of the immune system. And the way in which they give their commands is through producing various chemicals, many of which are called cytokines. And cytokines are hormone-like chemicals that cause other various immune cells and bodily cells to then receive these chemicals and change their physiological responses so that they can adapt to a given to fighting in a given a given infection and the way that helper T cells are most often activated is through their interaction with macrophages a third type of T cell are the memory T cells and memory T cells are kept around long term. So for several years, maybe up to a decade or more in a person's life, once a person recovers from a given infection, memory T cells will circulate in the blood and remain in the thymus in case that person was to encounter that same infectious organism or same antigen. And if exposure occurs, the person may not know it, because a very rapid response will result in a huge production of antibodies in a very short period of time. And so rather than an infection and a set of symptoms occurring, a secondary exposure will be rapidly taken care of by memory T cells. And finally, on this slide, we have the mention of regulatory T cells. Regulatory T cells formerly known as tumor suppressor cells, are basically a type of T cell that serves to downregulate the immune response or turn it off. There's a point where uh, an immune response can be too intense. So um, a well-known example of an overwhelming 
overly intense immune response would be something like anaphylactic shock. Anaphylaxis is where there's a huge overreaction and the T regulatory cells are there to most of the time suppress such an event. So when an immune response needs to be downregulated, the T regulatory cells should be there to serve their purpose. Two major types of cytokines are listed here and should be remembered as major players within bringing about immune response. We have interleukin-1, abbreviated IL-1, and the source of IL-1 mainly comes from the macrophage. The macrophage we saw in a previous slide can act as not only a phagocyte, but after it ingests and digests a, a given pathogen, it can present some of the bits and pieces as antigens to the T helper cells. And the T helper cells in turn will be activated by that interleukin-1 so that they can secrete interleukin-2. So it's sort of easy to memorize that after interleukin-1 comes interleukin-2. We know that interleukin-1 also acts as a pyrogen. It can induce fever by interacting with the hypothalamus, which is the thermostat located at the base of the brain, and um, so fever can result. But moving on to interleukin-2, which is abbreviated IL-2, this is sourced from T helper cells, which then are giving this chemical command, which brings about a variety of stimulatory effects it can trigger more T-cell division. It also then serves to activate uh, cytotoxic T-cells, which are abbreviated here as T sub C. Uh, helper T-cells are abbreviated T sub H. And it can also have the ability to boost the growth of natural killer cells, which is a type of lymphocyte from the second line of defense. And then the lymphocytes T and B cells from the third lines of defense or the third line of defense. The response of a helper T cell unfolds in a sequence of events that are outlined in this slide and in the next slide. And we'll start with letter A here where we can say that T cells have receptors which are referred to as TCR, T cell receptors, which can bind to a specific antigen. And they also have other receptors for what's called major histocompatibility complex, or MHC. And so helper T cells depend on these TCR receptors and MHC so that they can be stimulated. And these stimulatory events are brought about by most often by macrophages, which will ingest and then process and present antigens after they destroy a pathogen during phagocytosis. And when they present this antigen um, through a process called antigen presentation, it's by taking that antigen and inserting it into their cell membrane to present to the T cell. When the macrophage presents the antigen to the T cell, that antigen will bind to the T cell receptor or TCR. And MHC molecules, which is the major histocompatibility complex on the macrophage, will aid in that binding process of that T cell to the macrophage. And there are three major types of MHC, but in this lecture, we're going to just do an overview um, if you're curious about the specifics of MHC, we could say that type 2 MHC is what's involved in this process of recognizing what's called non-self. And in your book, there is also MHC type 1 that's outlined in detail talking about uh, would in, involved in events that are recognizing self antigens, which are part of our body's own self, as opposed to foreign antigens that we've 
talked about in the sense of anything that the that is non-self. And we can say that these helper T cells are activated by this process of antigen presentation, by which then they will begin to divide and differentiate, stimulate B cells so that they can produce their antibodies and stimulate yet other T cells and phagocytes um, following these events. Here's a diagram that shows in a picture format all of the events that were just described in the previous two slides. So we can start on the left here where we see a macrophage. So we have a phagocytic cell that takes in a microorganism that has foreign antigen molecules on its surface ingestion and digestion will take place. And then here we have the antigen presentation. MHC is filled in here as this green portion. And this acts like the glue that is present on the macrophages surface as a way to hold the antigen in place and present it properly. So this is MHC type 2 for specific reference there if you're curious about the types of MHC and the helper T cell which is also referred to technically as a CD4 positive cell what this means CD stands for clusters of differentiation and this is really just a technical term for certain surface molecules on the helper T cell surface that are designed to bind to the MHC and the antigen that's present then on the antigen presenting cell, the macrophage. So the macrophage is the antigen presenting cell, APC. And here then we see this physical binding that takes place. And at this point, we can take note that what we're seeing is the second line of defense and this second line of defense which is the macrophage is physically interacting and chemically communicating with the third line of defense which in this case shows the helper T cell and then the cytotoxic T cells and B cells that make up this specific adaptive type of immunity that makes up the third line of defense. So the way that the second line of defense speaks to the third line of defense is through the release of the chemicals. So we can see these chemical signals here as IL-1 traveling from the macrophage to the helper T cell. And then we see IL-2, which actually stimulates three areas in this picture. The first area that interleukin-2 stimulates is the helper T cell itself. Interestingly, the helper T cell that secretes the interleukin-2 actually turns itself on. This is a process called autocrine stimulation. And so the interleukin-2 that's released by the helper T cell actually gets put into a positive feedback loop that causes that helper T cell to differentiate and grow and multiply. It turns itself on. But it also uses that interleukin-2 signal to send that stimulation to some cytotoxic T cells, which will then increase their activity, and also then the B cells, which we know are designed to produce antibodies. So we have all areas here listed within the third line of defense that are stimulated by interleukin-2. Here's a review slide outlining some of the major contributions of the macrophage. 
First, we know it is a non-specific part of immunity, specifically the, or I should say, part of the second line of defense. And we know that macrophages are a source of IL-1, so they secrete interleukin-1. And not only is that a pyrogen that can bring about inflammation and fever, but we know that it also serves to stimulate um, lymphocytes such as the helper T cells. And we know that macrophages are a major antigen presenting cell or APC and macrophages are really important in not only eliminating microorganisms, but also in fighting cancer cells and eliminating these unwanted um, entities within the body. Now let's take a look at the dynamics of antibody production. So B cells act to produce antibodies, and then we can look at the relative levels of what a B cell produces over time. So let's look first at the beginning of an, of an immunological event. So we can say that the relative concentration of antibodies in a person's system could start out so low that it's practically undetectable. But if a person is going to respond immunologically to a given antigen, we'll call that antigen X, then what can happen is, is that a primary immune response will occur. And during this primary response, over the course of about seven to 10 days, maybe up to two weeks, we'll see a peak initially in antibodies that are produced by a certain population of B cells that will react, be activated, and produce this concentration, a significant number of antibodies to that antigen. So antibodies to antigen X will be produced. We could call those anti-X antibodies. And then over time, if that infection or exposure to that antigen is dealt with, then that will eventually be eliminated or neutralized and the concentration of antibodies will fall dramatically. But that's because essentially that particular infection is over with or that response is no longer a concern. And the level of antibody concentration will fall, but not down to zero. So if you were to draw blood, you would see that a low level of serum antibodies would be present. But let's just say that sometime later, a secondary immune response was to result. And this would be following a second exposure to that antigen. And here we can see a much higher level of antibody concentration that can occur. And so a person here is what's called sensitized. And when that person comes in contact with that same antigen or foreign molecule, a much higher level of serum antibody concentration will occur. And this secondary immune response is referred to as an anamnestic response. Anamnestic is just a technical term for immunological memory. So memory B cells, which will still be left over will be called up to duty and much more rapidly they will be able to increase the serum antibody concentration to much greater amounts very quickly and this should result in a person's ability to eliminate a threat without even knowing that anything happened during that secondary exposure however this is true for a primary followed by secondary exposure to a given antigen. If we look at something brand new like antigen Y, then this process will take on a very similar kind of response to what we saw with X because this is something brand new. And then of course, if we were to extend this graph out and there was a secondary exposure to antibodies, I mean, exposure to antigen Y,
than a much larger number of antibodies, anti-Y antibodies would be produced in an anamnestic response in that case. There are five major classes of antibodies produced by the human body. And each class of antibody is denoted by these letters of the alphabet. We have IgA, IgD, IgE, IgG, and IgM. And each one has the prefix Ig for referring to immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin is a technical term for an antibody. Immuno refers to immune system or immune function. And globulin refers to the three-dimensional protein structure or unique shape that the, that, that antibody has to recognize and bind to an antigen. So in the case of immunoglobulin A, it's found in various bodily fluids like the mucus, saliva, tears, and breast milk. And it binds to possible pathogens in these parts of the body by having four binding sites. Here, 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 and here. So those four binding sites are found on two Y-shaped antibody structures. So IgA is referred to as a dimer because it has two antibody structures attached at their tail end, um, which is called the FC region, which is basically the, what denotes the antibody type. But then they dimerize together and their binding sites face outward, as we can see here. So this is what's called dimeric, referring to two parts. And so then there are four binding sites. Every monomer or Y-shaped antibody has two binding sites at the ends of each portion of the Y-shaped structures. IgD has its function as serving as the B cell receptor. So this is an antibody structure that's attached to the surface of B cells. And in lab, you learn about basophils and, and uh, mast cells, and these are cells that um, are activated then uh, by the IgD. IgE is a unique antibody that is known to be produced in response to parasitic worm infections. And it also is known to facilitate allergic reaction of some sorts. So um, IgE is also a monomer and has two binding sites, just like IgD, but they have different areas of activity physiologically in the immune system. And IgG can also be looked at as having similar structure as a monomer, but IgG plays a major role in um, being the most abundant antibody in the immune system. It's estimated that IgG comprises about 80% of the serum antibody population. So in the blood, 80% of the antibodies are IgG. And when compared to IgM, we can say that IgM makes up about 10% of the antibodies in the serum of the blood. And IgM is quite different in that it actually has 
five different Y-shaped monomeric structures that are hooked together in a formation that looks like a snowflake. And this is known as a pentamer. Penta referring to five parts. So this pentameric structure has 10 binding sites. And we can see from its structure that IgM would have the greatest efficiency at being able to bind antibodies in response to a given infection. I mean, not bind antibodies, sorry, bind antigens in response to a given infection. So when an infection occurs, the IgM is produced first. So when the body is responding to an infection, we will see the appearance of IgM antibodies, which have the, the greatest efficiency at binding and removing antigens and pathogens. And then over time, we'll see an elevation, a gradual elevation and rise then in the production of IgG, which we would say is produced second and then very high levels of IgG will be produced after the appearance of IgM. And this occurs over a period of seven to 10 days. So the immune response takes a while for this whole uh, sequence of events to unfold. There are two major types of immunity referred to as active versus passive. So first let's look at active immunity as being characterized as a type of immunity that occurs following exposure to an antigen or foreign molecule. And then an immune response will result and eventually the body will form some memory cells. So we have memory B cells that will form during active immunity as well as memory T cells. And this takes time to develop because the physiologically the body has to train and adapt to produce those types of B and T cells. And this results in long lasting immunity. So we can think of cases like suffering from an infection naturally, and then long-term immunity can result. But we can also think of vaccination as a mechanism for mimicking such an event where um, a person would be injected with attenuated viruses, which is you know, a weakened pathogen, or the same could be true for certain bacterial pathogens, and then the body will respond artificially to build immunity so that if the real thing is encountered, the person will already have memory B cells and T cells, which can mount a secondary response and a surge in antibodies will develop very quickly and protect the person from suffering an actual infection and set of symptoms. By contrast, the other major type of immunity is passive immunity. And passive immunity communicates conceptually that antibodies are transferred to a recipient, but that recipient does not gain the ability to make those antibodies. So no active B or T cells are formed, and the person doesn't build an adaptive immune response. Um, so the recipient will have a short-term protective effect. It delivers rapid protection, but then that will fade very quickly over time since there's no immunological memory. So we're talking a period of a few weeks to a couple of months. and this type of immunity can be cited as um, examples such as breastfeeding. So this is natural passive immunity from mother to child and the nursing baby will get antibodies through breast milk, which if you remember from the, um, the slide that has the types of antibodies, that would be IgA antibody and so those can come across the placenta as well and so you have IgG as well 
And so IgA and IgG antibodies can, can come through from mom to baby during passive immunity. And then a second major type of passive immunity that is delivered through medical technology would be via um, an injection. So an injection of gamma globulins, which are preformed antibodies that can be pharmaceutically formulated to protect a person against um, something like exposure to a toxin. So certain antibodies can be raised in a petri dish or in, an, in an, a lab animal and antitoxins can be given then. An example would be like a person who's suffering from uh, botulism food poisoning. And so the botulinum toxin, also known as Botox, if there was a toxic exposure to that, the person could be rushed into the hospital and they could be given the antitoxin or anti-serum as it's sometimes called. And so that's passive immunity. Lastly, we have what's called herd immunity. And herd immunity is the concept that a certain amount of people need to be vaccinated within a community or a given at-risk population for exposure to any given preventable disease. So if a vaccine is going to work, at least 80 to perhaps 90% of people ideally should have immunity towards that infection so that the number of people who are not vaccinated will likely not encounter that pathogen because there are dead ends all around with the people who are actually vaccinated and have an active um, capability physiologically to eliminate that pathogen and not allow it to multiply and then be passed around to people who would then be unprotected. So we can write down here that herd immunity requires a large majority of a population to be vaccinated or immune. And the minimum amount of people vaccinated or immune can vary from disease to disease. So we can't put an exact number, but we would usually say at least 80%. But some diseases are so contagious that that number could jump to 90% or above before herd immunity would be maximally effective. And this is why vaccination programs are so important, is that the majority of a population needs to be willing and able to safely take those vaccinations in order for herd immunity to be possible. And we know it works because the smallpox vaccine, for instance, was so successful that it was the only disease and the first disease to be eliminated entirely through human efforts and technology in the form of a vaccine. 